Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I don't know about you, but I think it's incredibly good news, actually. To me, it's such a relief. I tell you, you know, if I never preached a word of this, quite frankly, I've told my wife sitting on our porch, if I didn't preach a word of this, the peace and the joy that has given to me is worth all because I can remember living those days. See, I, I, this is not, you know, I was taught the same stuff most everybody else was taught and uh, lived in fear and, uh, you know, lived your whole life in fear and, and uh, you know, skepticism. And even your worldview is skewed by a doomsday type mentality. And every time we see something bad happens, our worldview is so skewed that we think, oh, this is one of the signs. But, uh, you know, after it fails over and over and over again, you start to think, see, I start thinking of the world in a different way than I used to think of it. As a matter of fact, I start, you know, think, uh, you know, that old song, I think to myself, what a beautiful world. Now, I do, I realize there's some very real problems in our world, and that's the thing that I think helps us to understand that the purpose of why we're understanding a lot of this is so that we can see that God is interested in doing something in our world. Not just getting us to heaven. How many know he will not fail? He will accomplish his purpose. He knows the end from the beginning and he will do all of his pleasure. And if he could foretell the stuff like he did in the book of Daniel and be precise and exact. Like I said, if I was not a believer and I was testing the validity of a God or or, or a book that talked about a God. And I could see the time stuff that's put in this book, just like I showed you in the first session. That from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, would be 483 years and exactly 483 years. He stands up and says, the Spirit of the Lord God has anointed me. And then everything that was prophesied transpired just like Daniel said it would. And I don't know if we realize sometimes how many times even in the New Testament that these Old Testament writers are quoted. Even Jesus himself, when he was standing before Caiaphas, and Caiaphas says to to him, tell us plainly, are you the Christ? Jesus quotes Daniel chapter 7, which we're going to go to here in just a few moments. And he he says to Caiaphas, His answer to Caiaphas, when Caiaphas said, are you the Christ, tell us plainly. He said, and from henceforth, you, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Great glory is a direct quote from Daniel chapter 7. And he says, you will see the Son of Man. Daniel is the only book that calls him the Son of Man. And that's why he identifies himself as the Son of Man. And that's why Caiaphas ran his clothes. Because he's saying, if this dude just blasphemed because he said he's the one that Daniel 7 talked about. These guys knew the scriptures. They knew, that, in other words, how many know that Paul... Peter, all the apostles, they didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to preach from. They preached Christ from the law and the prophets. All of it was pointing to something that was delivered to us in full, where we've received of his fullness all grace for grace. Now, we're not operating in everything that was given to us, but I think the thing has to happen is that we have to realize what has already been given to us objectively, so that we can walk in the subjective truth of what's already been delivered to us. How many can hear what I'm saying when I say that? And so uh, with that being said, I want to I tr- go back into the book of Daniel. We're going to start in the book of Daniel in this session. And this one might get a little, uh, uh, this, one, this one may be a little more difficult, but I think, I think that if you can see the context, let me be meticulous again in teaching this and lay it out because I want to talk in this session about some of the real hard scriptures, and one of them is going to be 1 Thessalonians 4. What about the coming of the Lord, the resurrection of the dead? 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to talk about that, and we're going to try to show you the context as well and what that means for us and what all is in, involved in that. I think it will help us immensely. Daniel 7, let's go there in the first year of Belteshazzar, or Belshazzar. Daniel 7, king of Babylon. Daniel had a dream and visions in his head as he was lying upon his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the gist of the matter. 
Daniel said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens, that is the political, and I'm reading this from the Amplified Bible again, the political and social agitations, were stirring up the great sea, that is the nations of the world. And four great beasts came up out of the sea in succession, and different one from another. The first one was the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the last session? Daniel's having the same, he's having, he's having this dream, except this time he's seeing these great beasts come up out of the sea in succession. The first one was Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. He was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And, and I looked till the wings of it were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon two feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, Medo-Persian Empire, was like a bear. And it raised up itself on one side or one dominion and three ribs went its mouth and between its teeth and it was told, Arise and devour much flesh. And after this I looked, and behold, another, the Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great, was like a leopard, which had four wings of a bird on its back. The beast also had four heads. They were Alexander's generals, his successors, and dominion was given to them. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, the Roman Empire, terrible, powerful, and dreadful, and exceeding strong. And it had great iron teeth, it devoured and crushed and trampled what was left with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that came before it, and it had ten horns, symbolizing ten kings. This beast was, again, the fourth beast was the Roman Empire. How many of you can see the digression of the kingdoms again? He's showing you from Babylon, the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. And he said, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. And I kept looking until thrones were placed for the assessors with the judge. And the ancient of days, God the eternal father took his seat, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool and his throne was like the fiery flame. Its wheels were burning fire. And a stream of fire came forth from before him, and thousand thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand rose up and stood before him. The judge was seated, and the courts were in session, and the books were opened. And I looked then because of the sound of the great words which the horn was speaking, and I watched until the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given over to be burned. Now let me just stop for a moment again and tell you, he's placing this scene of judgment during the time of this Roman Empire. He's putting it right in the context of this time slot. I want you to see that so powerfully because even when he kept, I looked until thrones were placed, verse 9, and the assessors with the judge and the Ancient of Days, God the Father, took his seat. If you would go to Matthew 19, verse number 28, Jesus says this to the disciples. Those of you who follow me, in the regeneration, will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So how many know he is talking about the scene of the judgment of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he's talking about it during the time of the Roman Empire, and the fulfillment of which he promises his 12 apostles that they will sit on 12 thrones with him judging. Can, can you see that he's putting the context of this in the period of time that we're seeing here as being the Roman Empire? Shake your head if you're tracking with me. And he goes, and, 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 all, and the books were open. I looked in because of the sound of the great words, verse 11, which the horn was speaking. And I watched until the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And for the rest of the beast, their power of dominion was taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for the duration of their lives was for a fixed season, for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions and behold, on the clouds of heaven came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And there was given him, the Messiah, dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, and the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. That is so powerful of a declaration that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven will win. Come on, somebody. 
But when Jesus was standing before Caiaphas and he says to Caiaphas, and from henceforth you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, he is quoting this verse. This verse is not about Jesus coming in the cloud to get you. This is a verse about his coming before the Ancient of Days to receive his coronation as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Come on, somebody. We got, our, we got it like, okay, and let me just tell you that they're all through the Bible. There are many, I, I wish I had 10 sessions because there's so much stuff that I'm leaving out. But there are all through the Bible, <laughs> there, are, there are all through the, there, there are all kinds of different cloud comings. Many of the times that he talks about coming in clouds, he rides upon the wings of the wind. He comes in the, makes darkness his secret place. He comes on the clouds. And in other words, every time that he would use that kind of a cloud coming all through the Old Testament, it was not a visible, literal return, but him coming in judgment against a nation of some type, and mostly an apostate Israel nation, as he would come in judgment to them, and sometimes he would use that as a foreign nation that would come, that would punish them and bring them back into subjection. In other words, that's why these people are in the trouble they're in, is because God told them in the book of Deuteronomy that when you forsake these things and you walk away from me, the nations are going to come, they're going to plunder you in the city, they're going to plunder you in the field, they're going to, they're going to take your kids, your cows, your cash, you're going to be carried away captive in other places, the edge of the sword. Will be. In other words, go read the book of Deuteronomy. And you'll see that the end of the old covenant bargain is, was completely fulfilled in the, in the book of Revelation. And the reason I don't believe that can happen again is because we're not under that covenant. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus, for that. Because what we, we don't understand sometimes is that we've been redeemed, but we've been redeemed not just from sin. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Jesus being made a curse for us. That's why we can lift up our heads because our redemption was drawing nigh is that we've been redeemed from the curse. That's why we sing the new song and the song of the Lamb in the New Testament is because he's redeemed us from that. I'm glad we're not up under a curse. Under any shape, fashion, or form, we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. But he's talking about the Ancient of Days coming on the clouds. He's talking about a judgment setting. He's talking about him coming in the clouds. And he's receiving the kingdom. The Messiah was, and, and, was, and there was given to him, the Messiah, dominion and glory and the kingdom that all nations' kingdoms and should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was grieved, anxious within me, and the visions of my head alarmed and agitated me. And I came near to the one who stood there and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. He said, these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the most high God, touch your neighbor, say he's talking about you right now. But the saints of the most high God shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. This is nothing but good news. Hallelujah. No hiccups in it. The, king, the, the saints of the Most High will possess the kingdom forever and forever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceeding terrible and shocking, whose teeth were of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke, and crushed, and trampled what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns representing ten kings that were on its head. And the other horn which came up later, and before which three of the horns fell, the horn which had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and which looked greater than the others. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. You can see that same beast in the book of Revelation. I have a whole, the whole study where I, take, I compare the book of Revelation, the beast of Revelation 13, with the beast of Daniel 7. The, the wording and even the verbiage is exact. Re Revelation 13, 7, it says, I looked and this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. It was given to the beast to make war with the saints and they overcame them for a time, times and a half times in the book of Revelation. For the three and a half years of the end of the scope of that prophecy that I showed you in the first session, the beast seemed to have make war with the saints and to overcome them. And he goes on to say, but, but the, and the ancient, and, and, and made war and prevailed over them. Revelation 13, verse verse 7 through 9, until the Ancient of Days came and the judgment was given to the saints of the Most High God and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. 
Thus the angel said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it in pieces. As for the ten horns out of his kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the former ones, and he shall subdue and put down three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change the time of the sacred feast and holy days and the law and the saints shall be given into his, t- into his hands for a time, two times, and a half time or three and one half years. If you go read that in Revelation 13, 1 through 6, this same description of this same beast wears out these same saints for three and a half years. The back end of the scope of the prophecies that I showed you in this chart. The 42 months, the times, times, and a half a times, which puts it right here that this, this piece of scripture is being fulfilled in the first century between about 66 to 70 A.D. 70 A.D. was when the temple was destroyed, the power of the holy people was finally broken, and their exclusive covenant with Yahweh was now completely destroyed because Judaism had to have a temple as its centerpiece. But when Jesus prophesied, not one stone will be left upon another, it happened exactly like Jesus said it would, exactly when Jesus said it would, within that generation, that this generation will not pass away until everything I told you comes to pass. Are you tracking with me? I'm trying to get you to see that the time slot is still the same. He shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints and the Most High, think to change the times of the sacred feast and the holy days and the law. And the saints shall be given to his hands for times, two times and a half times or three and a half years. But the judgment shall set by the court of the Most High. And they shall take away his dominion to consume it gradually and to destroy it suddenly in the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven. Let me tell you that without, after A.D. 70, within a few years, Rome would be so evangelized that it would become the centerpiece that would start to promote Christianity and the gospel would spread all over the world. Because the sword of his mouth that fought against this empire was the sword of the gospel that you see in Hebrews chapter 4. How many of there was a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth? How many of the gospel is still conquering? It is still going? It is still gradually increasing? It is still overcoming? It is still alive and well on the planet Earth? It is still leaven. Leaven, once you get it in, you can't get it out. My Uncle Bob that you all know, he was asking me about my Uncle Bob, back, my, my Aunt Linda, my Uncle Bob that went here for many years now are now going to our church because they moved to Berkeley Springs. But my Uncle Bob would come to our house every year in November because it's our deer season. I hope that doesn't offend you, but we hunt white-tailed deer. Hallelujah. Sorry, hallelujah. I love animals too. I love them fried, grilled, break. No, I've just got you. Man, I shouldn't do that because I, I'm sorry. I apologize if you're an animal lover. But my Uncle Bob would come to our house, and my mom always baked bread during that time for the people that were hunting with us. And she made what we called hoe cakes. Hoe cakes are where you take the bread and you start to make homemade bread and you put the yeast in it and you knead it and you, and then she would set it and, and that stuff would grow into it. It would just roll over the side of a pan. But what my mom would do is before the bread would be ready to break, she would tear off pieces of that raw dough and she would throw it in a skillet. I see my mouth starting to water now. She would throw it in a skillet of hot grease and fry that bread. If you've never had fried bread, you don't know what you're missing. And then we would put butter and all the nooks and crannies, or jelly, or brown sugar and cinnamon, and it was absolutely delicious. But you got to know how to eat hoe cakes. You cannot eat them till you're full. As my Uncle Bob would eat those hoe cakes because they were so delicious, and then he would go lay down on the couch to take a nap, and in about 20 minutes, he's in there going, oh, God, oh, Lord, because that bread was raisin. See, what are you trying to tell us? I'm trying to tell you some of you are getting some kingdom in you right now, and you're not going to be able to get it out. And the reason sometimes you get uncomfortable and it starts to stretch you is because you ate it till you were comfortable but it's starting to grow. See, the wonderful good news is he declares that of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. But he also puts some of this into the jurisdiction of the kingdom and the dominion 
and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven will give, be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. The reason I believe that seminars like this are so vitally important is because we are participators in the increase of his kingdom. That's not just to get people from here to there, but to get heaven to operate here. See, in him was life, and the life was the light. See, let me just say this to you. Sometimes we read into Scripture stuff that is not in them. For instance, here's one of them. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, not heaven. Because we think, I need to get on the straight and narrow so I can make heaven my home. That's not what he's trying to say there. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. I'm going to go on this side. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. There's a lot of people who are going in through destruction. In other words, you've got to have a whole lot of trouble that keeps on bringing you back and bringing you back. But the way that leads to life is the straight and narrow. But if you read the context of that in the next chapter, Jesus says this in John 10. He says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some, say this with me, some other way. Say it again, some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. Some other way. And then he says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. And then you get down in verse 9, he says, but I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. For the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have, not a ticket to heaven, life, and that you might have it more abundantly. That's not in the sweet by and by, that's the nasty now and now. So, <laughs> now don't get mad with me here, but the thief of John 10 is not the devil. The devil's never mentioned in John 10. I know we've said it so much that we think it is. The, de the devil's never mentioned in John 10. The thief of John 10 is not the devil. The devil might be involved, but the thief of John 10 is some other way. What was the some other way? Is that you think you can make it in through achieving through old covenant paradigms. And it didn't take your, it didn't give you your life. It took your life. Somebody help me over here now that. Come on, how many know religion can be a thief? Yes. Let, let me say this to you. I, I think I might have even said this on a Sunday morning when I was here back a few months ago to preach. But, you know, my mom, we grew up in, in real legalistic Pentecost. And I appreciate the fact that our roots were there. And we did what we did because we thought that's what God wanted from us. Yes. But here's the general rule when I was growing up. If it's fun, it's got to be a sin. It was a sin to play sports. It was a sin to play baseball. It was a sin to go to a movie. It was a sin to go, you know, your high school prom. It was a sin, you know. I mean, just the general rule is it's a sin to watch TV. We shot the TV set. It was a sin to drink Coca-Cola. It was a sin to eat devil's food cake. Devil, you know, it's just stuff wasn't even in the Bible. I mean, forget the law of Moses. It was the stuff we made up on top of that. But my mom said one day, she was at the grocery store, and she came back and she said, you know, she said, I saw today a saint of God. And then she'd get that little jerk on her, you know, that little pick. Ooh, hallelujah. Mm. I knew she was, ooh, Shunda. She starts Shunda a little bit, you know. I knew she was a saint. Oh, hallelujah, because of the glow on her face. And I'm just a young kid, and I'm thinking, Mom, that's not a glow. That's a shine from no makeup. You didn't know her because of the glow on her face. You knew her because she had a beehive or top knot for a hairdo. A dress between her knees and ankles. Black hair under pantyhose because it, it was a sin to shave your legs back then. Thank God we got delivered. Y'all don't. <laughs> Woman looked like granny from the, I'm not trying to put anybody down who believes God told them to do that. That's up to you if that's what you feel led to do. But what I'm simply saying is my mom said I knew she was a saint by the glow on her face. I'm thinking, Mom, you didn't know her because of the glow on her face. You knew her because she looked like you and our dress code we had. And this is what my mom said. What a testimony this woman's life was to the world. Except the world's looking at this and saying, you mean your God makes you look like that? 
So if your God makes you live like that, then I don't really not interested in your God until I'm 85 and got three more breaths left. Now, come on with me. See, if heaven is like where we went to church at, do we really want to go there? Well, just a thought. If you don't like my thoughts, have some of your own. What I'm simply saying is sometimes religion has so robbed us of our lives that half of our anxiety and stress and half of why the world is on mood-enhancing drugs in Christianity too. And I'm not trying to get you off of your medicine. Don't misunderstand me. I've seen you off of it. And some folks, I'm not trying to put that down. That doesn't make you weak. What I'm simply saying is that though I think a lot of it, we were talking, him and I were talking about a pastor that I know personally. That's all, I mean, he's almost had several nervous breakdowns, but a lot of it is the theology, the theology of fear and a God who is moments away from either killing you or you being left behind or you're not performing well enough or you've got to achieve this or achieve that is literally draining the life out of them because it is a thief. It is not it all it is all that ever came before him but once you get him you get the life because the straight and narrow is not performance it's a person and it's in that book back there called the great i am because it's one of the the, the word jesus says i am he says i am the way i am the truth and i am the life and i am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly so what i believe that will happen is that the real gospel will give you back your life and the life becomes the light and people in the world will say i want a life like that one I'm convinced that a lot of our anxiety, I'm getting some answers to some stuff we talked about a while ago. I'm, I'm convinced a lot of our anxiety and stress have come from Christianity. We, we walk down to church out and trade one set of stress and problems for another one. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus began to declare in Matthew 11, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Walk with me. Work with me. See how I do it, and you will learn the unforced rhythm of grace. But the key is, it's not just I've thrilled a many a crowd by saying, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you burned out on religion? And Peter, have them shout the house down, and I'm on board with that. But that's not the end of that verse. He said, walk with me. Work with me. See how I do it. And then he says in that verse, you will recover your life. You'll get your life back. You'll get your peace back, your joy back. Come on, somebody. You'll get your looks back, your peace back, your romance back, your wife back, your kids will come back, your money will come back. Oh, y'all don't want to help me preach here. You'll recover your life. He says in Romans, the fifth chapter, here it is in the Message Bible. He says, here it is in a nutshell. One man did it wrong, got us in all this trouble, sin and death. And another man did it right and got us out of it. Not thrilled to many a crowd by preaching you're not in trouble anymore. And you're not in trouble anymore. That is good news. But the next part of that... I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled, The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.